First, uh, let me thank um, the Lloyd's uh, Registers Foundation and uh, especially Professor Craig for this very gracious uh, invitation to come and give, us, give you a talk a little bit about um, the establishment of this new institute, this LRF Institute, uh, for the public understanding of race, which will be based at the National University of Singapore. Um, as you could see, uh, just by the date of this uh, particular um, institute, we launched, um, and we are very grateful that Richard came all the way to Singapore to join the launch, to grace the launch. Um, it was 3rd of October, so we are like barely 10 days old. But Richard said, uh, why not come over and talk to all of you? This is the LRF community. And um, try to share uh, with all of you some of the excitement that we are facing. But certainly, if you think about it, uh, Reese is not something that is, is, is new. It's a very old problem. You think deeper a little bit about it. It is a very basic element of our life. Reese precedes a probability, precedes um, most of the things that we would think, um, so-called a thinking part of Reese. But what I hope to share with you is that besides the thinking part of Reese, you have this feeling part of Reese. As an individual, we do not necessarily perceive Reese based on evidence, uh, based on probability. Now, why in the world would we need to have such an institute? Um, and what is, it, what is it meant to do? Well, I, I think, unfortunately, there would be, ex, there would be a, 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 a pragmatic consequences if Reese were to be communicated in a way that results in, say, elevated sense of anxiety in the society. Our policymakers will react to such anxiety. That's the way a democratic institution will work. And that, that obviously has pra huge uh, pragmatic uh, uh, ramification in how resources will be allocated. But I, I think that the really, really intriguing new element that's coming into play at this point in time is that conversation about risk is now extremely noisy. It's extremely noisy simply because each of us um, is owning a mobile. The mobile is connected to a social platform. Everybody now gets to talk about anything basically, about any topic. Now, who will you trust? Will you trust a media, a paper? Will you trust a member of parliament? Will you trust a minister? Will you trust a professor such as myself? Clearly, I, I, I feel one of the very basic goals we'd like to achieve is that we'd like to enter the conversation as a trusted and authoritative voice, as Richard nicely put it, we would like to sway the conversation in a way that would be directed towards something that is perhaps a lot more balanced. And that, that was very nicely articulated by Sir David as well. So what I hope to, to, to take us uh, very briefly uh, this morning, if I may, is that I'm just going to talk about the thinking part, the feeling part. And at this point in time, of course, I do not wish to uh, precede um, what the uh, Foresight Review panel will bring into this institute. Um, and in fact, that's the purpose for me to be here as well, to meet up with all the very bright people in this audience, and perhaps to engage you all to join to this. Um, I think the way Richard put it is that this is a very heroic enterprise, but one got to do something heroic once in your life, I guess. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what we want to do in the, in the RF Institute. What is this idea about thinking about risk? Um, but perhaps I can, I can I can, ex I can uh, look at it from a slightly different angle. What, what actually do we mean about risk? Not from the perspective of an expert, but from the perspective of a lay person. I thought I'll just take out my trusty Oxford English Dictionary. I, I'm not going to read through the uh, uh, slides, but essentially risk, for, for us to, to, to think about risk, it has to consist of three very basic elements. Uh, typically, it has to be something unpleasant. If you're going to win the lottery, say a million pounds, you don't really say that, you know, that's a risk, risky enterprise, right? Um, you don't call that risk. There has to be a sense of uncertainty. So uncertainty means that you do not quite know whether this unpleasant event is going to happen. And the third thing is going to ha the third element that's necessary is actually an exposure. In this case, an exposure to the public that we are most interested in. An example where where we would not uh, consider something to be risky would be, say, a massive landslide occurring in the middle of nowhere. Now, this is clearly an uncertain event, a massive landslide. It is kind of unpleasant, uh, if you could look at it that way, although it's kind of very natural in a geomorpho uh, geomorphomic sense. But if there were to be no human community placed in harm's way, 
um, there's no need for us to make a decision at this point in time. So ultimately, it comes down to the fact that um, once you contemplate risk from that angle, you need to make a decision. And that's key. Do you want to do anything about it? Even if you take the decision or do anything about it, that itself is a decision, obviously. I said at the very beginning of this talk that risk is not new. In fact, I, 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 this is a famous document. Some of you may know it's the Chinese I Ching. This document has been around since 1000 BC. Um, it was attributed to the Zhou dynasty in China. I'm not going to read through this, but essentially, um, if you look at this document, and this document is still widely uh, used, by the way, within the uh, Chinese community. And, and people, I, I would say that uh, this is a very good way of uh, communicating risk. Everybody accepts it. It defines your chances of um, something happening unpleasant, and it provides a, a procedure in which you could shield or ward yourself against all these um, unpleasant situations. But there's no cause and effect. There's no understanding, there's no science, there's no evidence. Now, um, we can't, in my opinion, we can't outperform this document, I Ching. It has lasted for so long, it, there must be a reason for its existence. It tells you the state of mind. That living in this very uncertain world, people need a form of security. The other aspect that I thought is very interesting is that for this institute to be based in Asia, there is a cross-cultural element regarding risk perception that is rather understudied in our opinion in Asia. And this is related to culture. Culture could come from a document such as I Ching. Now, let me, let me get to the part where we, we, we talk about the thinking part of risk. I'm just showing you some of these are pictures because these are nice pictures. These are things that you will get to see in the papers. And, and they, they, they obviously tells you immediately, wow, you know, something not very great is happening. If I happen to be in the middle of one of these, um, one of these uh, earthquake heat uh, area, something bad is going to happen to me. Now, as a, a, a risk analyst would do, and I happen to be, that happens to be one of my specialization, as a risk analyst, this is something that's done across the world at this point in time. I'm just giving an example of a project done by the United Nations Development Program. This is a global hotspots uh, program. What it does is it essentially looks at all the possible uh, natural hazards that can happen on a global basis. But what I wanted to show using this, very uh, using this as an illustration is that if you look at a map here, this is a, a, a world population map. You'll notice that the other dark brown spots are centered around Asia. Now, that doesn't come as a surprise. I think 4.4 billion people stay in Asia. It constitutes 60% of the world population. So regardless of what risk you're talking about, the largest number of people Standing in harm's way uh, is in Asia. We, we are literally at a very, very um, situated, uh, in a very good location in Singapore to be able to gain access uh, to this uh, part of the world as a test bed. These are just simply the historical uh, tracks of cyclones. They are called typhoons uh, around our area. And based on this historical track, um, it tells you the, 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 the likelihood um, of, of the hazards that, that could impact uh, this particular uh, population. So it's a very kind of simple way of visualizing risk among the expert. We simply look at the likelihood, whether it's at high or low. We look at the consequence. Is it going to be low? Is it going to be high? You, you try to envisage within this fairly simplistic, but at, it is based on science, it is based on evidence and data. You try to make a decision, a systematic decision, that if the risk were to be unacceptable, you would like to do something about it. In some cases, you could reduce the hazard. In some cases, you can't. You can't really go against the forces of nature. Um, you could try to reduce the consequences by relocating, building stronger buildings and whatnot. Um, that, that is what, in, in, in a couple of words, is the purpose of a quantitative risk assessment. But the, the question, of course, is that um, for this whole thing to work, we need to pose ourselves the question under what situation do we need to take action? In other words, under what, situa under what situation would a risk be considered to be unacceptable or it's not safe enough? And I, I thought again, you know, um, the literature is vast, by the way. I'm just um, sampling the literature, in this case, um, referring to this very interesting uh, 
uh, a case, Edwards versus the National Coal Board. Uh, Mr. Edwards was killed in an accident when a, um, a roadway, a my roadway, uh, collapsed. The National Coal Board uh, actually argued that it's impossible. It's just too costly for them to support every single mine roadway to the degree that such accidents will not happen. And in the, in the judgment uh, made, uh, the, the concept came about that um, it is sufficient to be reasonably practical. And that's not the same as being physically possible. You could physically pos it is physically possible to make the road very, very strong. But reasonably practical requires you to think about putting risk on two scale, one requiring some sacrifices um, involved in averting the risk. And you, all you need to show is that there's a disproportionate uh, difference between the two scale, and you have discharged your onus. So that, that is a legal principle that many of us rely on um, in which um, to, to our best ability uh, to define uh, the meaning of acceptable or tolerable risk. Um, the nuclear industry is a very unique industry, um, incidentally. Uh, the reason why I highlight it is that many, many of this interesting research, which I would be sharing with you later on, risk perception actually came from the nuclear industry. The nuclear industry um, were the first to find out that um, a lot of this work on um, quantitative risk assessment didn't quite, the public didn't quite get it. The public are still very fearful, of, very fearful of nuclear industry. I'm just exhibiting three examples. The latest would be Fukushima example in Japan. What is interesting, um, and this is just a, a cutout from a local newspaper, The Straits Times in Singapore. What is really interesting is that after the event, so it's not just merely the risk of an accident in the event, the event actually totally paralyzed the entire nuclear industry in Japan because at this point today, um, the workers are still going to work in the nuclear power plant in Japan, but the power plants are off. You can't, you can't activate the power plant because I presume the public is not willing to accept it. So there's this huge social ripple effect beyond the original incident. The original incident obviously create a massive um, uh, 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 increase in social acceptance of this uh, particular uh, 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 event. Well, this is about public understanding of risk. I think the first thing we need to know is to know what people are really worried about. I thought this is a nice example because I took it from a classic st um, study by Slovich. He did a survey of a couple of groups of people. I mean, you could just, I hope you could see, yeah, you could, these are different um, cohorts. The last column referred to the risk experts. You notice the anchors on nuclear power, the experts are gauge on a ranking of 1 to 30, 1 being the most risky event, the nuclear power is number 20 on the risk of 1 to 30. If you look at the um, 40 uh, women voters, you look at 30 college students, they rank it as number 1. So firstly, there's a gap. That's clear-cut if you do a survey. And this is just a representative form of information. We did a similar study in NUS recently. What we did was that we did an online survey of 1,000 participants in China, 1,000 participants in India. We got them to look at very broad category. These are the category you extracted from the World Economic Forum Risk Report. Um, this is a report that's been published uh, once a year. I was mentioning just accident incidentally that um, one of the uh, discussion items we had last week was very interesting. It talks about emerging technology. Emerging technology obviously has a vast potential to mitigate a lot of the risks that we are talking about. But emerging, emerging technology has an opposite effect that can exacerbate the risk. Number one, the least is uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. Number two is biotechnology. We are now capable of re-engineering life um, at the most basic molecular scale. And what does that mean? So um, interestingly, we found that the Chinese, that's the red bar, they are really worried about economic risk. You look at the blue bar, the Indian um, participants were worried about uh, environmental risk. So Asia is not a homogeneous uh, block at this point in time. It has this huge diversity where people are worried about different things. And that, that, that diversity is good as well. We also look at how they perceive risk. Um, the red bar represents um, what we call the actual risk. 
things that we could get from uh, authoritative text and report. The blue bar represents um, how the participants uh, view about some of this uh, representative category of risk. Uh, what we found was that for risks that are low, there's a tendency for the public to overestimate such risks. So you get a little bit more worried about things that actually has a less likelihood of uh, occurring. And this is, again, very well established results in the literature. It shows, again, there's a, there's a gap, there's a clear gap between perception and reality. Uh, but sometimes if perce perception can become reality, if um, there's no means of us correcting that perception. And this is about feeling part that I thought I could, I could, I could share very briefly. That compared to this very nice and neat, elegant framework when we talk about quantitative risk assessment, how we as an individual perceive risk is actually extremely complex. I'm not going to run through all the categories, but some of this may make some sense to you. Um, essentially, the first category, 1 to 12, it conveys a feeling of dread. And what does dread mean? Well, one way I tell people, dread is essentially something like extinction-level event. In fact, some risks that we're facing nowadays, we could literally get into this extinction level. Global catastrophe. Threatens future generations. These are things that are really, really bad. So that's a feeling of dread. Another thing that really affects us is this feeling of familiarity. Things that we're familiar with tends to be affected down. We think it's less risky. Things that um, is unfamiliar with tends to exacerbate the risk. Now, that's common sense, right? Unfamiliar simply means that when it goes bad, you do not know how bad it becomes. There's no upper bound. You cannot conceive how bad you can't put a cap. Your imagination runs wild. This is a fertile area for imagination. And that's going to be interesting. Risk is an old area, but the topic has become fascinating recently because emerging technology is creating situations where we don't have historical information. We, we don't quite know. We are just kind of like um, going along, feeling our way through the situation. Now, these two factors, uh, this is a research study shown to be very important. Um, on this uh, two-factor space, you could quite clearly see that the way the public perceive, um, it's not surprising that um, nuclear plant radioactivity, DNA technology, these are all in the upper right-hand corner, unfamiliar, dreadful. The public would, would, would increasingly agitate for regulation, huge pressure, similarly social reaper. It extends beyond the boundary of the uh, particular event. So these are two ways in which um, our, our psychologists frame the problem um, regarding a risk perception. So this institute, the way we think about it at this point in time is that it's not about experts, perhaps a, a person such as, my, as myself may be guilty of, and experts that, that will come and give you tons of information, give you tons of, inf of evidence or you know, all kinds of um, stuff and try to convince the public that we are right. It's not about us, the experts, talking all the time, but it's to acknowledge that the lay person, and the lay person in this case would, could pretty much apply to all of us, since we can't be experts in everything, um, is it, to understand that the lay person actually has a, a richer conception of risk. They have legitimate concerns. We are thinking at this point in time that for this institute to make sense, we have to listen as well. It's not just a matter of us gathering experts to tell the public uh, how they should respond. So it's, it's, it's two ways. I think that will make more sense. I, I, if I may, uh, give me two minutes because this is the reason why I'm here. <laughs> this is our vision. We wanted to be a permanent world-leading research institute. <laughs> and we aspire to do that so that we could influence uh, risk communication globally in the sense that I've articulated, essentially, for us to be able to bring in good science, good data, but at the same time to appreciate how people feel and to mediate between this lay and expert community. We would have a particular focus in Asia because simply because Asia is a very rich ground uh, for us to exercise an impact in. Research is very scarce. There are many vulnerable communities in Asia. Population is huge. Environmental risk is a distinct concern at this point in time. We are very, very grateful to the Lloyd's Registers Foundation 
because this institute is not possible without a grant of 10 million pounds. And this is matched by NUS. This is to show an equal partnership between NUS and RIF. NUS is matching with 11 million pounds. Um, we are most grateful because um, this is actually the largest uh, gift that uh, RIF has uh, endowed upon a foreign institution. And so we are very privileged that uh, RIF has chosen us as a partner to engage in this effort, which we feel and we share that is really important. Perhaps I could gel um, and boil down the three challenges that we think is, is kind of important for us to address. And the first is listen. You want to talk about public understanding of risk, I think we've got to understand what the public are really worried about. We can uh, exploit uh, uh, all this new emerging technology in data analytics, big data. It can be in a structured form, it can be a more structured form. Uh, to, to look into this, we need to develop more effective uh, risk communication tools. I think Sir David put up a very, very interesting presentation of that. In fact, um, th this reminds me of a uh, statement that uh, Professor, uh, uh, Professor Figerhoff from Carnegie Mellon used to say. He says that, you know, um, offering untested uh, communication is almost as bad as offering untested medicine because it, it, doesn't, it, it could create a situation that's worse than not communicating at all. And I think the third part is very important because there's an interrelationship between the experts and the layperson. The mediation is not as simple as, you could see that uh, the two concepts are, 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 uh, there is a distance, there's a gap between the two concepts. And incidentally, on that note, I have not actually covered um, um, what's the effect of a group compared to an individual. We do not live in cave by ourselves. We are social animals, we work together. And the, the past couple of speakers have talked about the effect of a group. And, and that's common sense, right? Some of us may engage in very risky activities because our best friend says that it's very safe. So that's peer pressure. I have not actually spoken about it uh, in light of time. But I thought I'll end on this note. Um, as I said, I was in Geneva last week. I was attending this uh, uh, World Economic Forum uh, workshop. On, on CNN, I, I happened to be watching this uh, debate um, that was chat. Um, I think it was... Um, uh, on, because there was an IMF uh, gathering at the same point in time. And, and some of you may have watched this, and this is a very interesting saying that the world leaders are getting it, the public doesn't trust us. We, we, we have an environment where there's an, it's acknowledged that there's increasing erosion of trust, and that is not helpful to us at all, obviously. I, perhaps I run out of time. I, I could just leave this um, on, on the back of the... Uh, Oh, I take some questions, perhaps. Well, I uh, congratulate on launching uh, of your uh, research institute. Well, actually, um, my question, uh, I, I wanted to also give this question to previous speech, but I think this question is also available to your speech. Uh, well, actually, um, it seems that uh, risk uh, is uh, defined slightly differently in, in different communities, but in our engineering community, uh, risk can be defined as a product of uh, likelihood of hazard and consequence, as you mentioned. Therefore, according to this figure, it is obvious that uh, uh, one may reduce uh, likelihood or uh, consequence or both to reduce risks. So uh, it is extremely important to assess uh, risks in, 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 in a quantitative manner rather than qualitative. I, I, it's very important, but on the other hand, uh, we need to define uh, acceptance criteria of risks for successful design and engineering and operation of industrial products. Um, but existing uh, risk acceptance criteria, like uh, for example, ALAP, as you mentioned, is very vague. You know, a lot, as, as low as reasonably practicable or achievable, it's very, very vague. It's challenging to determine the, some exact, uh, exact value of acceptance cr criteria. What is your view on this challenge? No, I absolutely agree. I think there's a potential interface that could be elaborated because for people working in quantitative risk assessment, 
indeed, um, one of the key questions, or I would say that's the, the grand challenge, is to be able to get a better handle on the, the idea of what is acceptable risk. Uh, but, I, well, we feel that there, there will be opportunities for us to be able to clarify these questions that you're posing. But I, I think there's a need for us to, to, to bring in the public. And therefore, some of these uh, concepts could be adjusted. Some of these acceptable risks could be adjusted uh, based on um, what the uh, social scientists uh, have done. Um, kind of like, you know, these are work done uh, for the past 30 years. So I think there's a really fruitful uh, space, a white space. It's not a, 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 a small space. Actually, for the engineers and the scientists to work with the, um, the psychologists, the social scientists, you know, I, I think this is where we hope our institute could uh, contribute. And it should start off fundamentally, um, in fact, based on all the discussion we had over the past, it should fundamentally be uh, multi uh, disciplinary. What I'm sharing with you this morning are work that's known, although a lot of the work is actually not done in Asia. Thank you for a nice presentation. Yongan came from Seoul National University. Uh, probably you know that yeah, about a couple of years ago, there was a big accident in Korea. It's a several ferry, actually ferry ship uh, had a capsized on accidents. And I personally uh, involved in the uh, uh, investigation so what caused the such kind of capsize that they are one of the conclusions that we made is that people uh, didn't aware as a risk so there was uh, many regulations to prevent such kind of disease well a disaster uh, by law by ethical code by many many things but some risk can be foreseen like a terror or accidents the natural or they just can be, in a sense, it can be predictable, or not, even if not predictable, uh, we know that. But in many cases, human beings doesn't aware as a risk, then the accidents happens. So I just wonder if you want to touch such, uh, such kind of like a human matters in your center. Um, I, I think definitely if you look at just the first, uh, the first word on the title of the, um, on, that the institute is named is public. And that means the emphasis has to be on the person, either as an individual. I think that's a, perhaps one way that we could approach, but eventually as a group, as an organization. Now, what you say is absolutely very, very important because sometimes we make decisions, and these are all very well-known research. There's cognitive bias. Some of the cognitive bias comes about because we don't have full information. We don't have sufficient information. And that's where the institute would, would become useful. If we could set ourselves up in the right way, there are lots and lots of all this research done all over the world. I, 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 should, I should certainly mention it since I work in this area. Lots and lots of it all over the world. So for us to actually get this thing, uh, to achieve this ambition, we actually need the help of uh, um, all this um, excellent research that's been conducted around the world so that we could channel this information in the right way. And that's important. It's not just pushing the information out in the right way so that the public could appreciate um, and by appreciating in a way that's more balanced, uh, firstly, their life would be less anxious. Uh, and if we can do that, that's not, not a bad thing, right? Making people less anxious, we could, we could, we could make people feel safer. Um, but secondly, I think by doing that at the same time, we can actually get um, public policy makers to, to, to respond in a way that perhaps is more optimal than working just based on Facebook hysteria and we just lately had a case of that in Singapore because we got hit by this Zika virus. And you could tell the hysteria, you, could, you, you don't even need to do any research to talk about hysteria because overnight you cannot find any insect repellent in any shop. It just, it just got wiped out within a single day. And I have friends coming to see me very frantically because I travel regularly. They said, can you go around looking for insect repellent in whichever country and bring them back to Singapore? Simply because he has, a, he has a young wife and, and she's pregnant. So this, is, this is, is ongoing. It just happened over the past one month or so. So this is huge. 